you guys flickers of fear time once again my movie review series so i haven't actually seen all of the coen brothers films uh at this point i've seen a good portion of them but honestly like every single one of them that i've seen has been just uniquely wonderful in its in its own right so uh i was very excited to see that hbo max had put up uh the coen brothers debut film blood simple from 1984 so i was like really jacked i'm like yeah i'm that really it's about time that i revisited that because i think i saw it once probably back in the mid 1990s i want to say and i remembered liking it a lot but i hadn't watched it again since then and didn't really remember much about it other than having just like a general positive impression of it and i think like i remembered a few iconic uh shots particularly like of the end sequence i have to say though that re-watching it the movie is every bit as awesome as the first time i saw it and probably even more so nowadays because now i kind of have the perspective you know i'm older now and i can appreciate movies more like i've seen more movies in the interim and i've seen more of the coen brothers movies too so i can really see since this was their first one you can really get a good perspective on what their you know what their start out was like because there's a lot of stuff in here that they they would utilize again like later on in their filmography. So it's kind of amazing to think of, but Joel and Ethan Cohen were really not all that long out of college when they decided to make Blood Simple. Now, Joel Cohen uh, had, in fact, recently worked on, uh, he was an assistant editor on a little film, you may have heard of it, called Sam Raimi's Evil Dead. What ended up happening with that is because Sam Raimi, um, probably most horror fans know this, but he actually got funding for the Evil Dead by making a short film, which was kind of along the same lines, and it was called Within the Woods. And that would basically be like a trailer that he could show to potential investors. And he just went around like pounding the pavement, looking for people that would give him money. So when the Coen brothers were like, yeah, we want to write and do our own movie, um, he's like, well, maybe that's what you should do. You should make like a trailer and then go around trying to find people that'll give you money, you know? So that's basically what they did. Um, they went around, they actually made this kind of short reel. It was really more like a trailer than a short film. Um, and it actually had, fun fact, the legendary Bruce Campbell in it. Uh, and it was shot by Barry Sonnenfeld, who had also just recently graduated from film school and who would obviously um, later go on to become, uh, you know, an amazing director in his own right. Uh, he did the Adams Family movies from the 1990s. He did the Men in Black movies. He did Get Shorty. He did a bunch of other ones. So basically what the Coen brothers did was they took this trailer, this short film, and they lugged a projector around like to show this trailer at the houses of just friends, friends of friends, acquaintances, anybody who might give them, you know, like their dentist or whatever that might give them like a little bit of cash to make this movie. So it took them about a year, but they ended up getting uh, $1.5 million, which is what they wanted to make the movie. So they put the thing into production. It's kind of like amazing. It's very old school, but the fact that they believed that much in their movie and they were just willing to basically go ask a bunch of people for money, like going door to door pretty much, I mean, is pretty awesome. Now for the female lead in the film, uh, they initially wanted Holly Hunter but uh, she actually wasn't available at the time. Now, obviously she would be in their second film, which was Raising Arizona, the beloved uh, dark screwball comedy, one of my favorite movies of theirs. Um, so because she couldn't do it, she's like, oh, I have this roommate who's also an actress and her name is Frances McDormand. Now, Frances McDormand had been like a stage actress up to this point, I believe Blood Simple was her first screen appearance. And this obviously was, <laughs> The fact that this happened was pretty amazing because the Coen brothers would go on to work with Frances McDormand countless times. It's just like a bunch of times. She's the, probably their most frequent coll frequent collaborator. Uh, and also the whole thing took a personal turn as well because Frances McDormand and Joel Coen got married in 1984, the same year that this film was released. And uh, they are still married to this day. So that's also pretty awesome. Now, another story I heard about this movie is that for one of the main lead roles, they had actually written the role specifically for the iconic character actor M. Emmett Walsh. 
And so they went to him and asked him to be in the movie. And he's like, look, I don't know who the fuck you guys are. I mean, they were basically just out of film school, right? It's like there was these two untested youngsters, like, asking him to be in a movie. And he's like, they're like, oh, well, we'll give you a percentage of the gross. And he was like, fuck that. I don't know. He was like, this movie might not make any money and shit like that. So they're like, okay, well, we'll give you a check every day. He's like, I'm not taking a check from you either. So it's like they basically had to give him, like, his fee, like, every day, like, in cash. That's the only way he would do it, um, which is hilarious. That's just, I don't know if that's true, but that's a story I heard. So uh, this part, though, like, after the movie came out, would actually get M. Emmett Walsh an Independent Spirit Award. And to be honest, like, watching the film again, it's really, really hard to imagine this movie with anybody else in the role because he just, like, crushes it. He just plays... He's just really jolly, but also really menacing. He's just so, so good in this movie. So it's just funny that he was like, so I understand why he was so reluctant, but you know what I mean? So also in the cast, we have, I mean, the cast is like fairly small. There's really only four or five principal characters. Uh, you also have John Getz, who would actually later be in David Cronenberg's uh, remake of The Fly, among other things. Uh, Dan Hedaya, who was also, and I remembered him from The Hunger. He was like the police uh investigator in that he was also in commando he's been in a million things too he's like even if you don't know his name like you've definitely seen him in something because he's been in tons of things uh and also there was the theater and tv actor slash writer uh sam art williams who i don't think acted too much in movies after the early 1990s but he was in this as well in a fairly small role so the title blood simple actually comes from a line in the dashiell hammett uh novel red harvest which came out in 1929 now, this movie is classed as a neo-noir, but it almost has kind of like a pulp horror sort of sensibility to it, like layered in with a lot of the classic noir tropes, which are sometimes kind of like also upended, like in a lot of really interesting ways. Like many of Co the Coen Brothers' other movies, because they've made movies in lots and lots of different genres, and they always have... They like to play with the tropes of each particular genre that they tackle, and it's all there's always just like something interesting to see, and this movie is no exception. Now, this movie too, like the influence of Sam Raimi is pretty apparent, especially in some of the camera movements. And if you've seen the movie, there's one particular shot that's very, very that's obviously an homage to Sam Raimi. But I'm gonna have to say that on the whole, this movie is largely I mean, the Coen brothers kind of emerging almost fully formed with their own unique style, like right out of the gate. I mean, yeah, there's homages to other directors and Joel and Ethan Coen are definitely like students of film and are very like intellectual in the way that they approach things, but they're doing their own thing. And it's always like really interesting, whatever it is they're doing. So if you're a fan of the Coen brothers later films, uh, watching this movie, if you haven't seen it, you will see like earlier kind of like, echoes or I guess pre-echoes I guess it would be like of some of their later movies particularly Fargo um the man who wasn't there that was their black and white one with uh Joe, with um Billy Bob Thornton and uh No Country for Old Men this is kind of similar to that as well uh like many of their movies the plots kind of deal with some half-baked or harebrained scheme that begins to dramatically unravel as kind of like mistake or misunderstanding builds upon mistake or misunderstanding until everything is just gone completely and utterly foobar. Uh, there's also that kind of like trademark Coen Brothers deadpan humor. Like it's pr it's fairly understated in Blood Simple and it's, you know, considerably less wacky than their follow-up, which was Raising Arizona. But um, it is there nonetheless. It it's just very, very subdued. And like I said, very straight faced, but it's still that kind of like black humor that they're known for. So in the story, Frances McDormand plays Abby and she is the wife of this Texas bar owner named Julian Marty, who's playing, played by Dan Hedaya. Uh, he's almost exclusively referred to by his last name of Marty. So it's pretty clear from the outset that Marty is kind of a controlling douche and possibly, probably even abusive. And Abby seems like she's pretty much had enough of his shit. And she's like, well, I better get out of here before I shoot his face off. Now, perhaps unwisely, uh, she chooses to begin an affair with one of her husband's employees, who is a bartender named Ray, who's played by John Getz. Now, Marty is a shitty husband, sure, but he is also not stupid. 
So he knows his wife is up to something, and he hires a private investigator named Lauren Visser, who is M. Emmett Walsh, to find out who exactly it is that she's banging. So Visser starts following Abby around and, like, follows Abby and Ray to a motel and actually starts taking photos of them, like, in bed together. Now, the funny thing about this, <laughs> the kind of, like, fucked up thing about this, is that Marty did not actually ask Visser to take pictures. Like, he didn't... He's like, I didn't need to see photographic evidence. I just wanted to find out what was going on. And that kind of like right away clues you in. Like Visser, apparently he's just like, oh, well, that's just a perk of the job. Like implying that he's like taking him for his own personal <laughs> edification, I guess. Uh, so that kind of clues you in right away that he's kind of a sleaze and probably dangerous as well. Uh, you know, no matter what his kind of down home, jovial, folksy kind of like facade would have you believe. So when Ray later on goes back to the bar to quit, like after, you know, everybody's found out like what's going on and he's like, look, your wife's leaving you and I'm going to come back and I quit and I really need to like collect my last two weeks like his back pay. Marty starts putting the idea in his head that Abby is just playing him and that she's eventually going to screw him too and like not in the fun way. Now this ambiguity about Abby's motives like actually ends up haunting Ray for the rest of the movie's runtime causing a tremendous amount of suspense as the couple they just increasingly miscommunicate and kind of like talk past each other as events start getting darker and darker that's kind of one of the main one of the best things that generates suspense in the movie is that you as the audience you kind of know entirely what it is, like what's going on. You're privy to like all this information. You're privy to everyone's like what they're doing, but the characters don't know. So that's kind of the thing. Like, so, like I said, that's what I meant with there's all these like misunderstandings and stuff like that. Cause it's just like, oh, well this person did that thing. I'm like, no, they didn't do that thing, but that person thought they did that thing. And that made them do this other thing, which fucked up all this other stuff. So that's kind of like what, like I said, that's what causes the tension throughout the thing is that you know what's going on, but the characters don't. So uh, Marty actually attempts to bodily abduct Abby from Ray's house, which seems a little excessive, but Abby uh, breaks his finger, like bends his finger way back, which is pretty uh, harrowing to watch, and gives him a real solid kick in the balls, a nice one, uh, and that actually makes him puke up his lunch in the front yard. Now, because his uh, little ego cannot take this slight to his manhood, <laughs> evidently, he decides uh, that he's going to hire Visser to kill both Abby and Ray for $10,000, which seems like quite a bargain for two murders, just saying. <laughs> so Visser, uh, who is an opportunist, if there's anything, like, uh, you know, he agrees. And he's like, well, here's what you do. He tells Marty, go on a very, very obvious fishing trip. Tell everybody that you're going and make sure that while you're there, you're seen by as many people as possible and I'll take care of it while you're away so you have an alibi. Now, when Marty gets back, um, you know, Visser has already called him and said, yeah, it's done. So he meets Visser at his bar to hand over the cash after Visser produces photographic evidence this time that Abby and Ray are dead. Like there's a picture of them and they're in bed and they're all, they've shot and everything. But because this event happens at probably only about the halfway point of the movie, maybe not even that much in, um, you just know that it's not going to be as cut and dried as all that. It's like, the end, <laughs> job done, paid, uh, yeah. Uh, so what happens then is that Visser, quite unexpectedly, uh, shoots Marty where he sits and just leaves him in the bar for dead. Now, soon after this, we learn that Ray and Abby are still very much alive and actually have no idea that Visser took photos of them sleeping and doctored them to make it look as though they'd been shot just so he could get the money for killing them without actually having to, you know, kill them. So from this point forward, the movie becomes just like this ever more intricate web of misunderstandings and fuck ups and double crosses as kind of like, like Ray starts to believe that Abby shot her husband. And then he's like, oh, well I have to cover it up for her. 
uh, without telling her, you know, so there's that. Um, another employee of the bar, his name is Maurice. Uh, he thinks Ray stole the $10,000 with the payout from like the bar's safe, even though that was the cover story that Marty gave like to say where the $10,000 went so he could cover up, you know, paying somebody to kill his wife. You know, Abby actually probably doesn't even realize that Marty is dead and has no fucking idea what the hell is going on, even though everybody thinks she does. So it's that. Visser, too, uh, starts to become convinced that he's going to have to eliminate Abby and Ray from the equation, like, to keep his part in the scheme from being exposed, even though, really, they don't know who the fuck he is either. So, like I said, it's just kind of this whole misunderstanding thing. So, yeah, it's, like, this fantastically labyrinthine plot, like, just all these mistaken assumptions on the parts of all the characters, which end up leading, of course, to tragic consequences. But despite all that, like, all the twists and turns, it's still pretty straightforward and like pretty easy to follow and one event follows very logically and very naturally on from the last and the movie is also I have to say just like perfectly paced I mean it just keeps up the tension like all throughout the 96 minutes it's just a very very taut thriller and it just kind of like keeps you on the edge of your seat like the whole time I have to say too I also love the score for this uh it was done by Carter Burwell this was actually his first uh of many scores that he did he worked with them a lot like later on it's very it's it's a very simple piano score it's very moody it's very somber and I really really like it um it also has the the movie also has like a good but, you know, judicious use of, like, some cool songs. There's, like, Four Tops, Patsy Cline, like, stuff like that that's in there. So that's kind of cool, too. But I really do love that background piano score. Now, much like uh, several of the Coen Brothers' later films as well, Blood Simple also has just long stretches of screen time with no dialogue. But you'll be, seriously, you'll be too riveted to, like, the action that's going on to even notice that nobody is talking. Um, I mean, you know, I didn't notice. And it also makes a great use of a lot of your thriller tropes, um, has a few moments of like real grim, like brutality, like I said, like almost a horror movie kind of sensibility and has a few like well-placed jump scares too. If you've seen it, you know, like the whole newspaper hitting the door, which like scared the absolute shit out of me. <laughs> I was just like, what the fuck was that? It's just like, I jumped off my fucking seat. But yeah, and the whole final sequence of this, like with Abby and uh, Visser, is just terrifying. It's really, really suspenseful, really done well. And uh, also the whole thing ends with a piece of just real delicious irony uh, that kind of just puts the chef's kiss on top of the whole shebang. So yeah, so even though I hadn't seen it since the 90s, uh, in my opinion, Blood Simple really hasn't dated at all. Um, it's still like a really great masterful thriller, neo-noir with some horror movie like kind of stuff in it that, I mean, anybody that's into the Coen Brothers later stuff, you should absolutely dig it. Like I said, if you have HBO Max, it's on there. That's where I watched it. I think it's on Amazon Prime as well, but I don't know if you have to pay to rent it or not, but I did see that it was on there. But yeah, it's really, really great. And if you haven't seen it, then you definitely should. I liked it a lot and probably Probably, so will you. If you've seen it, let me know in the comments what you thought about it. And that will do it for this Flickers of Fear. I'll see you guys again on the next one. Bye.